Now, owners of the land on which the University of Health and Allied Sciences has been built in the Voltu Regional Capital Hall picketed at the entrance of the campus Tuesday morning to demand compensation they say is due them from government. Owners of the 702-acre land say they will continue to picket at the entrance until their compensations are fully paid. Fred Kwame Asari's report. Government, through an executive instrument composed really, acquired a 702-acre land for the first public university in the Volta region, which was established by an act of parliament in 2011. Consultant for the landowners, William Dafiamekpo, explained documents covering payment of the compensations were processed at the Lands Commission and forwarded to the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry for clearance for the claims to be paid. He added, the Solicitor General at the Attorney General's Department in Accra confirmed to them the Eswar Mahama government set aside 29.3 million Ghana CDs for payment of their compensations. I will process for land valuation. Based upon that, they issue offer letter stating amounts entitled to each landowner, which have been accepted by the landowners. And this was sent to the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources for just signature to approve it. He's just tossing the landowners up and down. Tomorrow, he's not in the office, he's going to Kumansi, he's going to Susan Soup. And the people are dying. Do we allow the people to die before we come? No. So the, we are saying they should pay the people now, now, now. Otherwise, we embarrass the school. Something nasty and coffee will happen at the school. And that one, we should not be blamed as valuers because the people are now uh, 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 fed up with government tactics of delaying the payment. So if something should happen, they should not blame anybody. Secretary of the Landowners, Dr. Winfrey Kwame Nakoche, emphasized they would continue to picket at the campus until their compensations are paid because government has failed to honor its promises. Uh, they took their land from us, uh, promising to finish their documentation and pay us immediately. One and a half years ago, they finished their documentation. And so we've been after them, all that, organizing press conferences for them to pay us. And we even went to see the Attorney General at Accra twice. And she promised us that the money for our land has been put into an escrow account. So money is not a problem, but as soon as they finish their documentation, they will pay us. Another landowner, Patricia Dogbe, lamented, life has been difficult after government took away her 15-acre family land, which they used for farming to support the family, as well as the education of the award. We used to farm here to support the uh, family, but since they took the, this thing, the land, we are no more farming. So, and up to now, they refuse to pay us. Even we have been going to court, we said, uh, next month they will pay us, by March they will pay us, up to now. And on that, two people are dying, leaving the land. Why can't we enjoy our land money before we go to our ancestors? So, we should try to pay us our money. Elsewhere, a group of angry machete-wielding youth of the New Patriotic Party at Sablelugu in the northern region have vowed to prevent the newly appointed municipal chief executive for the area, Hajia Aisha Tusedu, from taking office. The violent youth group, numbering about 100, staged a demonstration accusing the MCE of high bribing assembly members to endorse her. Hajia Seydu has faced opposition since her nomination from the youth of the area who say she has not contributed much to the New Patriotic Party. Hashmin Mohammed's report. The youth, clad in red and holding placards, marched through the principal streets of the district and finally converged at the forecourt of the municipal assembly to lock up the office of the municipal chief executive, Hajia Aisha Tuseidu. The municipal chief executive is here to make her first official visit to her office 30 days after she was sworn in. But there have been threats on her life by the angry youth, barring her from attending gatherings as guest of honor and threatening to make life unbearable for her 
should she report at her post. The group said Haji Aisha Tuseidu is not a committed member of the NPP and did not also cast her vote in any of the constituencies in the municipality. We still stand by our early position before the confirmation that the said Haji Aisha Seydou is not acceptable, acceptable no. as the MCE for Sablogon Anton Municipal Assembly. Our reasons remain unchanged. One, Haji Aisha is not a registered voter in either of the two constituencies in the district. Two, she has never participated actively in any MPP activity in any of the two constituencies in the municipality. Three, she bribed the assembly members, I repeat, she bribed the assembly members to confirm her, which is a criminal act under the constitution. Though the police gave protection to the group throughout the demonstration, they looked on as they locked up the office of the municipal chief executive. We're seeing in the northern region where police in Tamale have beefed up security at the teaching hospital following Monday's confusion over the handing over of leadership to a new management. There was a standoff at the hospital after the CEO, Dr. Prosper Akambong, refused to hand over the post to Dr. Akobila as new CEO, claiming he has not received any letter from any higher authority to stand down from his post. Dr. Akambong refused to hand over because, according to him, a letter from the health ministry did not indicate he was no more the CEO of the facility. The health ministry says its inability to communicate the transfer of the current Tamil Teaching Hospital CEO, Dr. Prosper Akambong, is to blame for the clashes that erupted between two MPP youth groups in the area. Two groups affiliated with the governing New Patriotic Party clashed Monday over who has the right to head the hospital. One of the youth groups held a news conference to protest the announcement of Dr. David Akovila as the new CEO of the hospital. Correspondent Hashmin Mohammed joins me with more on this. Hello, Hashmin. What more can you tell us about the situation at the Tamale Teaching Hospital? Well, security has been beefed up at the facility. And this morning when I visited the facility, I could count over dozens of police officers and police who were detailed to the police in staff to uh, know that uh, health officials at the facility are able to go about their normal without any hindrances. And the youth group themselves have been spoken to by the leadership of the new patriotic party in the region. So it is this morning as we come half the tent to the Tabalitian Hospital. All right, so we understand there are two youth groups involved. Which two groups are these? Well, earlier, uh, before the handing the hundred oh, there were two medics at the facility who were claiming that they have been appointed to executive officer for the Tamalitian Hospital. Now, that's a, the, Dr. Akolbila uh, was he claimed he is the new chief executive, and then the head of the pathological unit of the Tamalitian Hospital, one Dr. Ibrahim, also claimed he was appointed as CEO of the sister facility. And these two groups had their supporters based in the new patrol. So these two were all they are able to move their candidates, their, their, their candidates or their preferred choice to that particular position. So yesterday, uh, I, 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 the youth group that are affiliated to Dr. Ibrahim preparing to stage press conference when the Kandahar youth met them and then a lot go against what with the person that the president has appointed. And so for that matter, they will not allow them to hold that press conference. And that led to the pick up there. Now, do we know if these, this leadership struggle affected healthcare delivery in any way? Well, when I visited the facility there, I spoke to uh, some health officials, and they are saying that uh, they are worried that political issues now happen at the, the hospital. Uh, it is about politicians take their hands off management of the American hospital so that they can have their peace of mind to work 
you remember earlier, there is somewhere uh, in, in February uh, that, that this same youth group attacked the facility, demanding that uh, the, the outgoing chief executive, Dr. Akambon, leave office. We are saying that all this put together is affecting health in the country at the facility. All right, thank you very much, uh, Hashmin Mohammed, bringing us up to speed with developments there in the northern regional capital, Tamale. You're watching Journey News Prime. We're taking a break, but still to come in the bulletin. The autopsy report on Major Mahama has revealed to us shot several times. We've also been to the town and discovered a, pre a previous settlement of the people of Dentrobuasi said to have been cursed. We have all that and more coming up in the bulletin. Please stay tuned. NGO Child Rights International is requesting the police to make known the whereabouts of the boy said to have been picked up as one of the suspects wanted for the lynching of Major Maxwell Mahama late last month. The NGO at a news conference says though the 12-year-old boy is supposed to have been placed in juvenile detention, it could not find him in any of the country's juvenile centers. Chief Executive Bright Appear reminded the investigative bodies that they are required to treat the child as a suspect is stipulated by the Children's Act. Investigation points to the fact that we took interest in this to also uh, find out the whereabouts of this child, whether we can find the child within the juvenile justice system or not. But our investigation points to the fact that, or we cannot, we cannot locate the child within the juvenile justice system. And we cannot also locate the child within the community. So it suggests that the child is nowhere to be found so far as we are concerned. And our interest is that the states, irrespective of the, the offense, we must try as much as possible to put a law to test where it demands a certain process that process must be followed. The NGO also highlighted what it describes as the excessive exposure of the children of Major Mahama as an infringement on their dignity and privacy with implications for their ability to socialize in the future. Im images of the incident as well as images of the children may give opportunity to some moral persons to keep the footage and try to share with children in the later time of their life. Individuals, institutions, and even the courts must take the appropriate step to protect the best interests of children in matters that concerns them. So it is a major responsibility on us as a nation to always protect the best interests of children in any situation. Even if it is an unfortunate event, we still have to protect the interest of children. And we believe that this single act that all of us were involved in would have repercussion on the life and the development of these children. Ms. Zapia added the state must also provide rehabilitation to children from Dentrobuasi who witnessed the lynching or who were abandoned by their parents and guardians who fled the town after the incident. As a result of the incident, parents have to, uh, parents fled the community, leaving their children behind, unattended to. And some left it in the hands of their guardians and friends, and some also must seek refuge for their children. It is important to know that such situation makes children more vulnerable and expose them to all forms of abuse where there's no monitoring. So for us to abandon our children means that we are abandoning our responsibility to monitor them to have a right to education, health care, shelter, and even protection. What is required in such circumstances for us is that the district assembly must provide services to ensure that the care and protection of children are guaranteed, even in such situations. Now, the central region town of Dentro Boise has been in the news lately for the lynching of Major Maxwell Mahama after the townsfolk wrongly accused him as an armed robber. 
The town following the killing has become stigmatized with many raining curses on its people and giving them all sorts of names. Latest information available to join News Harvest suggests the town has a history that may well be haunting it and which its residents may wish to rewrite. Insure Films or Hearing Terry has been doing some digging and reports on how the inhabitants had to relocate after their previous settlement was cursed. The intro of Wasi attracted global attention when residents pounced on a military officer and beat him to death in broad daylight on the faithful Monday of 29th May 2017. Major Mahama had committed no crime except for the people suspecting he was an armed robber. The incident, according to sources, had been preceded in 2012 by the killing in similar fashion one of three men believed to be national security operatives. Joy News was told of how the old danger of Wasi town was once cursed by an unknown person who had cited residents for unfair treatment at the town's original location. That case, according to mythical accounts, turned residents and the entire community into standing rocks shaped in human sizes. When they resettled at the present place, residents were barred from the old site for any reason. The chief and selected elders, however, offered sacrifices to their ancestors there every two years. With time, the area, covering about four miles square, has grown into a thick forest. 86-year-old Nanako Jonsonwa is an elder of Dencha Abwasi. The town used to be called Obosomase. Chiefs and elders performed sacrifice to gods every two years. There used to be a river here where no one was allowed to step in, drink, urinate, or even spit in unless a sacrifice was made. People in the town were very wicked and never accepted foreigners or visitors. The day a family in the town accepted a visitor, people turned into rocks. Today, I have been able to assess a power home without offering a sacrifice. The prohibited land, though has been covered by thick forests, is now open to human visit. Elders of New Densha Abwasi want the area developed into a tourist site to generate income for the community, as echoed by the chief linguist Nanakwabina Asari. If the place is turned into a tourist site, revenue will be generated for the community. The score is endorsed by caretaker chief. Abba West Regional Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Hafiz Bin Sali, has suggested that the new military garrison, which is under construction in Wa, be named after Major Maxwell Adam Mahama, who was brutally murdered in the central region town of Denchobwasi exactly two weeks ago. According to him, even though Major Maxwell Adam Mahama's death affected many people in the country, his home region of the Upper West region was a harder hit and will not be out of place to honor his memory. Hafiz Bin Sali made the suggestion in an exclusive interview in WA with Upper West Region correspondent Rafiq Salam. Government in 2016 embarked on a program to construct military garrisons for regions that are without military barracks in the country. The Upper West Region is one region that was penciled to benefit from the military facility. Construction of a four-story 16 flats, officers and training ground were awarded to Bunas Company Limited. Construction work on the project started last July and work is going on steadily. Even though the project is yet to be completed, there are calls for the new military garrison to be named after Major Maxwell Adam Mahama, who was brutally murdered by a mob in the central region town of Bintrobwasi two weeks ago. One of such proponents is the Upper West Regional Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Hafiz Bin Sali. We are happy that the entire nation 
have joined in our bereavement. This is an indication that the nation is indeed united. Uh, I am particularly happy about government's proposal of uh, having a, a, a monument in his memory. And as a native and a citizen of the Upper West region, I have my personal views. I am aware that uh, a military barracks is under construction in Wa. And once the disease is from the Upper West region, I want to propose that His Excellency and the government should consider naming the war military barracks in his memory so that we can have the major uh, Adams Mahama barracks in war. I don't think it is strange. In Tamale, we have the, bar uh, we have the Bawa barracks occupied by the airborne force. Mr. Binsali said he is hopeful that justice will be brought to the perpetrators of the heinous crime. Reporting for Dwayne News, Rafik Salam. Wow. Right, so the very latest on this uh, Adam, Maxwell Adam uh, Mahama lynching is that the police has uh, concluded an autopsy report on the deceased soldier. And we have some information. Latif Idris is here and he has been following the story. He's going to be sharing with us a bit more uh, of what's coming out lately. So thank you very much, uh, Latif, for coming over. Now, what do we know about this latest autopsy report? Yeah, like you rightly pointed out, the autopsy report is out, uh, not in the public domain yet. Uh, what we know, according to this report, is that the late Major Adam Maxwell Mahama was shot multiple times. Uh, in fact, from the report, we know that pellets were retrieved from, from the body of, of the deceased, and the gunshot wounds is clear, uh, according to the report. So, so in this case, it, wa it, it wasn't the case that they simply, you know, beat him and hit him with blocks, blocks. but that they fired at him as well. They fired at him. And in, in the video, if, if you go back to the video that went viral, you would identify that there was a certain young man in this uh, video who fired at gunshots at, at the, the late major. And prior to these young guys of Den Chaubuasi ending the life of late Major. Y you could hear in the video one of them saying that the soldier is not dead. The man is not dead. Let's Suggesting let's that they should beat him some more and f finish him. Be because apparently they, they had fired at him previously. Mm. And uh, he was suggesting they had fired at him previously and exactly. he, he didn't die. Exactly. And so, and so they he needed probably to had finish some him. Spiritual powers. Or exactly. Something. So they needed to finish him at the point. And in the video, you, you wouldn't see clearly at which point these gunshots were fired. But uh, we know uh, that we, it we, happened. We, now, exactly. do we know if this report is going to be made available at any point in time as it made available to the public? Our sources at the police wouldn't say, but we know, again, that this autopsy report is going to play a key role in the um, trial that is ongoing. Uh, we know that 54 persons are currently standing trial, 52, sorry, are, are standing trial at uh, different courts, one here in Accra, the Accra Central District yeah. Court. And you covered uh, one of those yeah. when you were brought to, I think, about 40, a number 34, of 34, 34 of them, yeah, were, were are standing trial at the Accra Central District Court. We know that this autopsy report is going to feature greatly in, in this I mean, trial. I would like to read a bit of the reports that we have here. Um, so let me go straight. It says, in one of the evidence videos that circulated on social media, one of the attackers was said telling another person that a suspected armed robber in court, because that was how they branded the, the late major, uh, had fortified himself and that even though they had shot at him severally, he was still running. This, this brings to light the fact that the ma late major was shot multiple times. Now, do we know about the man who fired at him? Do we know if he's already in custody? Yeah, the checks we've run at the police indicate that this man is still on the run. It tells us that not all the persons who have been arrested so far took part 
in the in the lynching of the late major this man who we know landed the what many are describing as the final blow to the late major is still on the run and the police is is on on his trail all right thank you very much uh, latif idris bringing us up to speed with the very latest information we're getting which suggests that the late major maxwell adam mahama uh, had been shot several times before he passed uh, during that lynching incident at Dentra of Wase. We'll be keeping tabs on this particular story and we'll bring you more as and when we have it available. You're watching uh, Joy News Prime still to come in the bulletin. The member of Parliament for Sing South, the constituency under which the Singh as Mankasi DA Primary School in the Sing South District 4 says the school that improvised learning ICT with stones instead of a real computer mouse. As an IT, ICT laboratory at the JHS uh, section, we will bring you details on that. <laughs> Right up next though, we'll bring you business news that comes up after the break. Hello, good evening and welcome to business. An 11-member trade mission from the Netherlands horticultural sector is in Ghana to explore businesses and investment opportunities in the agri sector. The mission, which coincides with the third Ghana Veg, Fruit and Vegetable Fair, is uh, expected to see 50 companies tap into potential of the agri sector. The Netherlands ambassador to Ghana, Ron Stricker, announced a 12.5 million euro package for the Ghanaian agri sector. There's more in this report. 50 local and international stakeholders in the agri sector converge in Accra to display a variety of locally produced fruits and vegetables at the Ghana Veg exhibition. The Netherlands ambassador to Ghana, Ron Stricker, says the Dutch government is considering making Ghana a leading exporter of fruits and vegetables by 2020. He says his government is committing 12.5 million euros towards the project. We will expand it uh, up to 2020. Uh, I think it's more than um, uh, 10,000 public funds, uh, 10, 10 million euros public funding goes into it. But of course it is matched also by investment by the private sector. And the idea is of the Ghana Veg program to promote and stimulate um, vegetable growing in Ghana. Um, all kinds of vegetables, in particular the green ones, which are not the staple foods over here, which can be produced for the domestic markets and in the long term I think also for exports. Uh, but um, there is a huge potential to do more and to do better. And the essence is that we, um, we um, um, uh, facilitate farmers uh, uh, who see really farming and horticulture and vegetable growing as a profitable business uh, to help them uh, to better and improve their businesses. The Deputy Minister for Trade, Ahun Kalinti, said government is putting in place new measures to ensure food items exported from Ghana are not rejected on the European market. Speaking at the launch of the Ghana Verge event, Robert Ahumkalinsi hinted that a ban on the export of fruits and vegetables in Ghana by the European Union will be lifted in September this year. Focus on helping you grow your business. We will look at addressing, I know, a challenge where we have our current financial sanitary issues with the European Union, which we are very pleased the EU will work with on a track program and will look. And I'm very hopeful that come September, when the new mission comes, Ghana, made in Ghana vegetables will be accepted in Europe as the in Ghana itself. But the opportunity is so huge, and I think you as business people reflect that opportunity. Ghana Veg is an initiative supported by the Netherlands Embassy and driven by a strong belief in healthy and quality vegetables from Ghana through new ways of doing business. The initiative targets the high-end domestic and international market in Ghana under the supervision of the Ghana Netherlands Business and Culture Council, GNBCC. Now, more investments are still needed in the country's transmission and power generating plants to prevent recurring power outages. That's the advice coming from energy expert Ben Bwachi. 
This follows Monday's nationwide power outage that lasted for almost three hours. This is the second time in just two months that the country has experienced this challenge. Ghana Grid Company attributed the situation to slight problems with transmission lines between Ghana and the Ivory Coast. Many had argued with the coming on board of gas from Trinibua and Enyura and Tome and the Sankofa Jinyame fields, the country's challenge with power generation should be over. But Mr. Boachi tells Joy Business on the sidelines of this year's Ghana Energy Summit, the state of equipment being used in the sector needs to be looked at again. Ghana unfortunately has, you know, base loads that are pretty old. We have some of the machines uh, that are old machines, so sometimes they give up uh, uh, on us. And when that happens, then of course you have to adjust your demand to compensate for that loss. Uh, assuming, for example, that you lose one uh, thermal plant that is bringing you about two to three hundred megawatts of power, that means that demand has to scale down almost immediately to be able to compensate for that loss. Once you're not able to do that, then the entire system trips. You know, so you need an efficient uh, transmission system that is able to anticipate uh, some of these uh, defects or, or, or inefficiencies in our system, which we don't immediately uh, uh, have. Uh, on the radar of uh, Gridco, they should be able to monitor fairly how demand is performing. And once demand is outstripping supply, immediately they can knock off some areas uh, to allow the system to operate efficiently. Mm -hmm. But if there is a quick and sudden drop, which they are not able to monitor or pick uh, uh, on time, then the entire system collapses. And that's what we have been seeing uh, over time. And I think that they have to immediately work on uh, reliable systems, reliable generation units uh, that can maintain uh, uh, the peak load. Else, some of these intermittent uh, knock knockoffs will continue uh, uh, to happen. But, but, but they, have, they, they speaking to the director of engineer. He has argued that there is no cause of alarm. They have very modern equipment, and these uh, blips they do happen. It's normal everywhere. Are you are you convinced by that? I'm absolutely not convinced. Um, we have lived elsewhere. We know how systems operate. Um, to have your power sector, entire power system tripping, uh, uh, is, is not something that we can uh, relish or, or, or rejoice over. And uh, we need to find a solution to ensure that these things are not happening. What actually happened is that if you're not able to monitor more efficiently to see uh, 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 how plant these, some of these plants are running or you're not in touch, sometimes it happens even before uh, the signals are clear uh, before it goes down. So you have to constantly be in touch with the various plants so that they can give you the, the heads up that these plants are misbehaving, they could go off or we could anticipate uh, some shortfall. And when they do happen, be on the standby to knock down uh, some units. And usually when they are able to detect on time, they can knock off some of the big consuming areas, uh, 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 like uh, Achimota substation or Malam substation. On the other hand, Executive Director of the Kumasi Institute of Technology and Environment, Kite, Ishmael Ejokumihine, says a few hours of power failure observed by, by some parts of the country last night cannot be attributed to a generational challenge. According to him, such occurrences are bound to happen in the transmission system, even though they can be avoided. In an interview with Joy Business, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Jikumi Henry assured there's enough power to serve the country without any outage. It wasn't a generation problem, but it was, you know, what Greco does is balancing acts and making sure that we don't have excess generation and we don't have lower, uh, lower than needed supply. If they don't balance that, the system collapses. And the system is such that if for any reason you don't do it yourself, it will shut down to avoid the problem. So I, I, I accept what he said because it didn't take us too long to restore the power because if it's not a generation problem and it's a system problem, I think let's take it. But it is not, let's understand this. It can be avoidable so long as you have the system running the way they're supposed to run. I mean, it's not acceptable for you to, in, a, in, in a very, very, very stable uh, power systems. You don't have outages at all. But we are still in a situation where we deliberately will have to, for example, take off some of the loads. And then if you don't do it very well, before you realize the system is collapsing. So if, if we didn't have to worry about what we are using and dispatching, like, okay, 
look, we have maybe suddenly we have more thermal, and if that's the case, let's save the water in the lake. So, of course, we'll gradually turn off one of your systems. So we need to, the balancing act has to be gotten right. If we don't get it right, then the system will collapse because, so I think they need to also perfect the act. But there's so much predictability in everything that we have now. For example, they'll be there and then Atwabo will tell them that the compressor has developed some fault, so gas is not coming to the, the thing. So they have to immediately probably call VRA to start another generator. The, in fact, last week, Bui, you know, Bui is only supposed to be what we call a picking plant. It's only in the evening that it's supposed to come on. But when we were in Gridco, Bui was actually running one unit because they had lost a line, a, a unit from the Western uh, Corridor. So they always have to be watching and making sure very closely that everything that is running perfectly. I, I will repeat it. I will be the first to bash these guys. If it's a generation problem, we will have to talk about that. But so long as it's not a generation problem, Let's make sure that we focus not so much on the generation, but focus on making sure that we are transmitting power and distributing power. Otherwise, we continue to have. Now away from power, the president of the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industries, Nana Apiaji Dankawusu I, has lauded government's resolve to offer a $50 million stimulus package to help revive struggling businesses in the country. In an interview with Joy Business on the sidelines of the launch of the chamber's maiden edition um, of the business awards, and that appeared and also said the package deepens government's resolve to ensuring the one district, one factory initiative becomes a reality for private sector businesses. We are very happy because we have our input in that decision. And so if you see your input being adhered to and also heeded to as an advice given to government, you see it as a very laudable Seriously, you see, uh, we have other companies that are viable but uh, need some, you know, but distress in terms of resources. And so um, when the government came up with the one district, one factory, the whole thing is, is that we have two categories. The first category will be these uh, stimulus packages, those who are already existing and are not vi uh, viable but distress having problems or challenges with uh, you know financial financial and other logistic uh, problems so therefore it is a very welcome idea and that they they have consulted us um, um, wholly and we we are part of the whole process and uh, it's not about chamber members alone we are looking at the private sector in general and that we can improve the, the, um, the performance of the private sector just to uh, move to the next level of our socio-economic development. And that's all by way of business tonight. Thank you so much for your company. My name is Emmanuel Apuachi Riafi. For more business news updates, log on to www.myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Have a good evening. <laughs>Welcome back to Join News Prime. The National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, has identified sand winning as a major cause of the destructive tidal wave that ravaged the country's coastal communities over the weekend. As part of efforts to bring relief to victims, officials of NADMO are in the central region to distribute items to residents affected by the tidal waves. Matilda Wawega has more. In Cape Coast, a 52-year-old man lost his life as a result of the havoc wreaked by the high waves. Those who were mainly affected were fishermen. Speaking to Joy News, they urged government to extend the sea defense in the area to prevent the tidal waves from causing more damage. NADMO presented 2,000 CDs to the family of the 52-year-old fisherman who lost his life in Sunday's tidal waves. Director General of NADMO, Nanajeman Prempe, says the effect of Sunday's devastating waves is a result of the indiscriminate sand waning. There's one thing uh, we, we realize that most of this thing, even though the people are calling for a permanent measure, long-term measures, 
that will seize this kind of uh, disasters and others. But some of the problems are from the people themselves. Sand winning is one of the problems we are encountering. Sand winning. God created the sea and the land. Where human beings live, between where human beings live and the sea, there are some sands there that protects um, the, the sea from coming into where human beings live. Apparently, the people have taken all the sand away by the uh, process of this sand winning thing. We need to prevent people from doing the sand winning at our beaches. That is one big problem we have. And we call calling on all Ghanaians to support us to do that, prevent people from doing sand winning. Although residents have called on government to extend the sea defense, Central Regional Minister Kwame Nadankan says government does not have the funds for expansion, but as part of short-term plan, Rexec will be cracking the whip on sand winning along the coastal belt. If we as individuals who live in these uh, communities have listened to these uh, pieces of advice and have refrained from uh, winning sand, I'm sure we wouldn't have had the situation that is, is, on, our, is on, our hands, uh, on our hands now. And so uh, we, as the Regional Coordinating Council, have the mandate and power to ensure that we protect lives and protect property. So with this, quickly we are going to have a RECSEC meeting uh, where it will be attended by all the city chief executives, especially those in whose districts we have uh, the beach front, and to come up with a strategy which will include education and enforcement mm. of people who seek, either in the daytime or when we are all asleep, to go and win, that the law will catch up with them and that we're not going to sit for people to continue to engage in a thing like this so that the effect will register on all of us. That we can assure everybody that we will not sit, we'll take the necessary steps to ensure that we protect our beachfront. Matilda Homagas report. Well, director of the Center of Coastal Management, Dr. Daniel Zaheto, says sea defense systems are not sustainable means of controlling tidal waves. Displaced families and individuals who are victims of the recent tidal waves along the country's coast are calling for permanent solutions, including a sea defense project. Dr. Aheto, however, says studies of the trend over the years show that a clampdown on sand winning and tree planting along the coast will provide the necessary support for sustainability of any sea defense project. He spoke earlier on the polls with so Gifty Andrew up here. Sand is the first natural defense structure against such occurrences. And if you look at, along our coastline, especially in areas where we have beach sand, commercial extraction of uh, beach sand is pervasive. It's a very big problem. Uh, we are seeing quite a huge quantum uh, volumes of beach sand that are being transported. You know, but we also do know that under the minerals of beach sand mining is illegal. And, and so I would propose that uh, we look at the issue from a demand-driven side, where people or Ghanaians make up the, their minds not to purchase big sand for their building. And I think that would be the broader issue to look at. Yeah, um, I would also uh, propose beach nourishment programs where we also uh, plant uh, vegetation on the dunes in places where they occur. As a country, the National Development Planning uh, Commission mm. should come up with a vision for coastal management in, in terms of how we do our coastal and marine spatial planning, mm. which then will take into account uh, erosion control issues like that. Yeah, because uh, if you look at the costs involved in creating uh, such uh, massive natural defense structures, I mean artificial defense structures, it's something that we cannot sustain. For countries that have the, the where we are, I mean, the, the, the resources to do that, that is okay. But the point is that with tidal waves, sometimes uh, they overtop such defense structures. And then their, their relevance then is, not, is not seen. Transport operators in Kumasi want government to give them a share of the fee to collect for towing vehicles in the metropolis. The operators' demand comes as, a government, as government gets set to implement a set of compulsory fees set to come into force next month. It is one of several concerns raised by the stakeholders ahead of the rollout of the new fees. Nanasi and Sutmensen has been exploring the issue and filed the following report. 
Effective 1st July, motorists and motorcyclists will pay compulsory annual fees tied to acquisition of roadworthy certificates to cater for towing services. The National Road Safety Commission is introducing the service in order to rate the country's roads of abandoned broken down vehicles which cause accidents. The Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority and the Ghana Police Service are collaborators to ensure such vehicles are cleared off the road. Fees per year for both commercial and non-commercial vehicles, depending on tonnage, range from 20 Ghana cities to 200 Ghana cities. Though stakeholders appreciate the initiative would guarantee improved safety on the roads, there are concerns about fee levels and management of proceeds. Kwame Kuma is national chairman for Ghana Private Road Transport Union. Mr. Kuma also wants to know how such revenues will benefit payers beyond towing of their vehicles if they will break down at all. I talk to you. You may deny it, you know. Yeah, a GP at you, and as I draw a folk home, yeah, any stakeholders, a woman, I be a money person and a woman, and a Ochina Bibia benefit bank, and a yen so a present yen draw for no, Sabia, Yemenia. We, the GPRTU, are the major stakeholders in this policy. Though the policy is very laudable, we want authorities to come clear on the modalities and the prices. We want authorities to set aside a fund from the National Touring Project for the Drivers' Union. These are the inputs we want authorities to consider. Meanwhile, commercial drivers said the implementation of the service fees will affect their finances. There was some of plies the Kumasi Accra route. The project is not sustainable. I think our road system is not up to the standard of such an initiative. In terms of logistics, we are under-resourced. Our communication system is very bad. The government must employ several inputs to render the required services. So, how prepared is the DVLA to collect the fees in less than a month from now? Edmond Cheyo is Ashanti Regional Manager. For the DVLA, our role principally is to collect the revenue as and when vehicle owners come to do roadworthiness certification or during vehicle registration. And the payment is such that if you are a private uh, vehicle owner, you pay only once and it will be indicated on your receipt that you have paid and once you, have, you, you, you pay, anytime your vehicle breaks down, all you have to do is just to call to a free number which will be given by the National Road Safety Commission and then within some seconds or some minutes they will dispatch one of the trucks to come and tow the vehicle to a safety or a safe location. reporting. We're bringing international news next.
Now, the Tema Regional Police Command says the death of Constable Michael Poi with the Tema Regional Rapid Develop Deployment Force won't in any way affect the fight against crime or foreign forms in the region. It says this will rather push the police in putting in place extra measures in combating crime, which is one of its core duties as a service. Constable Michael Poi was shot dead by some unknown gunmen on a motorbike on the Michelle Camp Road whilst he was on patrol duty at about 9.30 p.m. Monday. His lifeless body was found in a pool of blood in a nearby bush after a resident informed the police about the incident. It was clear at the Tema Regional Command that they were mourning the falling officer who met his untimely death at the hands of some gunmen. Scarlets were seen around the entrance and doorposts as part of the mourning as the news of his death has brought mixed feelings to those in the service. Tema Region Police PROSP Joseph Nefodakwa tells Joe News the incident could be described as unfortunate. According to him, investigations have started into circumstances leading to the death of Constable Michael Boyd. Actually, it's rather very, very unfortunate that um, policemen who are there to protect their citizens, who are there to maintain law and order, should be attacked this way. But uh, I must say, it has rather gingered us up. It shows that uh, we have to give up security. And uh, even though maybe they are, they are looking at it in a different manner to this, you know, to this way this. But I must say we are being encouraged to work more. Uh, we are going to work harder. Uh, we are not dissuaded by this kind of action. We are going to beef up security and make sure uh, our mandate, that the work that we have uh, chosen to do, we would execute it to the fullest. Well, we don't want to pinpoint any area, but, uh, you know, as security men, uh, we, 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 we take into consideration uh, the security uh, measures that we need to put in place. So what we are doing now is um, we are not targeting any area, but uh, we will make sure that uh, we, we beef up security in all areas. Moale well, SP Joseph Nefodakwa says the family of the late officer has been made aware as the meeting took place between the two parties earlier Tuesday. Inspector General of Police, uh, upon hearing this, immediately sent a, a high-powered delegation from the headquarters uh, to join the Tema Regional Command. We have met, fortunately, uh, a, a police officer also, the, 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 he was an uncle to the, the fallen uh, officer. So he came around, we contacted them, we are in contact with the family, we visited the family to inform them about the incident. And uh, as I speak to you, um, the meeting is going on as to the way forward, what will be done, the measures to put in place. So um, we are doing everything to make sure that we curtail uh, this kind of incident. Uh, we are on it. Uh, as I said, uh, there is a police officer who is fronting for the family, and uh, we are in constant uh, communication as to what will be done. Uh, we met this morning, and uh, I think everything is on course. Uh. The police the general public to volunteer information that will assist them in arresting perpetrators behind the serious crime. The body of Constable Michael Poi has since been deposited at the police hospital morgue for observation and autopsy. The victims of the alleged 1.3 million US dollar gold scam that led to the interdiction of the Legon police commander are accusing the police administration of a cover-up. James Barry Berry, owner of Green Global Resources Limited, the company at the heart of the scandal, says police investigations stalled three months after the interdiction. Speaking of the pulse, he noted the company has not been able to recover the cash nor the gold bars in question. They took four U.S. citizens, representatives of our company, put them in jail for over 24 hours. This is an egregious act okay. uh, of, of police corruption. They not only stole uh, the uh, or misappropriated the gold, but they made our representatives, uh, mm. they intimidated them. Now, they said that the process that happened where our people were 
uh, brought down and arrested. Okay. Had to stay in a jail cell for mm -hmm. over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Did not receive any receipt or documentation for the seizure of our gold. So that was inappropriate. All of these actions were inappropriate for police behavior mm -hmm. and that they were going to do something about this and that they had some level of investigation that collaborated mm -hmm. all of our um, uh, facts at the time okay. and that they were going to get to the bottom of this very fast in a very fast time frame to to try to secure our either gold mm -hmm. return the gold to us or to return cash did they give you any timelines within which they were going to do this swiftly uh, gifty did it's, you ask did you demand timelines within which the police we, was going to do with it we asked them and they said this is a priority because our request to them is isn't a 1.3 million dollar uh, criminal case, mm -hmm. a CD criminal case, isn't that an important case for them? And they said, yes, this is a this is going to be a top priority mm -hmm. for our administration. How and long has it taken since you met him then? Because it, you would say it hasn't taken yeah. enough uh, time. Why then are you disappointed if you've met the new IGP and they say they're working on it? Is be that that's uh, a fair question, Gifty. Mm -hmm. There has been no communication, and we are led to believe that uh, nobody is, is interested in pursuing this case, and Would that you? nothing has occurred, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. We've had no communication. The Member of Parliament for Asinsa, the constituency under which they're saying at Mankesi DA Primary School in the Sinsa District Falls, says the school which improvised learning computer parts and the ICT with, the st with stones instead of a real mouse has an ICT laboratory at the JHJ section. Speaking to Joseph Opukugakbo in Parliament Tuesday, the MP said the teacher could have taken the children to use the mouse there. But in the report aired Monday, the head teacher of the school said several requests for computers have been unsuccessful. We have Richard Kojonyako on the line and uh, he's bringing us the very latest on this. Uh, hello Joseph. H hello Richard. Yeah, hi Israel. All right, so what's the very latest on uh, this story? We're told that the uh, District Director of Education has issues with the teacher in the school. Can you explain that to us? Well, Israel, the District Director of Education um, has been very busy and is instructing the officials in her, in her office to go to the school. So the officials went to the school, and when I went to the school after midday, I saw the second supervisor and other officials from the district education directorate. The director's beef was that was on how the news, uh, I mean, we broke the news, how come we got the teachers to speak with, and how come the teacher couldn't have used anything to teach other than uh, stones to teach the ICT. For instance, she suggested that the teacher could have brought his own computer from the house, or if he didn't even have a mouse, he, the teacher, could have used his money to buy the accessories of the computer that includes uh, the mouse. But the teacher, when we, when we went to the school, the teacher indicated that he brought his own mouse, but it was not enough to help the teaching and learning process. And so he decided that they would resort to the use of the stones that were readily available. And that is what they call improvisation. So I went there after midday, and then I saw all of these people. And the district director of education was very furious that the school has been disgraced, the district has been disgraced, the region has been disgraced, the entire country has been disgraced as a result of that one. And the teacher could have written a letter to the directorate uh, to tell them their problem. But according to the teacher and the head teacher I spoke with, they have made incessant appeals, including writing letters to the district directorate for them to help them. But all of these things have proved futile. They also showed me a computer that got damaged about four years ago and so it was not, I mean, something that the, the school could resort to in, in, in teaching the children. And so that is the reaction from the district director of education. She was very furious when I spoke with her. All right. Now, Richard, just hold on a bit. We actually have the head teacher speaking. Let's listen to her and then uh, we'll come back and continue this. The first one is you saw is the computer. From class one to class six, we don't have one computer in the school. You used to have one damaged one at my office. So doing the practical, then they come and you to touch it. Now it's still there, it's just damaged. 
it's not a spoil, a totally spoil. That way they were using to help their children to see the computer themselves. But now, when I came here, they were using the device and I asked them to uh, find a, a means to get one computer in the school. So this is the first uh, step that the teacher took. So we need computers in the school. That one there, it's must because the topic is from class one to classes. We have to teach ICT. Right, so Richard, we just uh, had the head teacher of the school making, uh, confirming what we were saying earlier, that indeed they have made several requests to get computers and they haven't uh, gotten it. Now, I, what I understand from what you're telling us is that there's an attempt to intimidate the teacher and the, and the head teacher. Yes, um, the, when I spoke with the head teacher, he said that um, she does not approve uh, or her outfit does not approve of the method the teacher used and how we even went to the school without seeking the permission from the district education directly. I said, he said that, I mean, she couldn't, she as a director couldn't have gone to anywhere like Joy FM to take pictures and the others. I tried explaining to her that Joy FM is a private entity and the school is a public place and the children needed help. And that is the crux of the matter. Apart from that one, there is nothing. And I asked her whether there is indeed some computer in the school and she said that well they brought some small laptops that were distributed to the school and she's unsure whether the school had access to some of these laptops all right thank you very much uh, richard uh, kojo nyako so now let's go back to the member of parliament for Asin south uh, his area or he is the mp for this uh, particular area where the school is and he has been saying that in fact the there's an ICT laboratory at the JSS, AJHS section, and he would have wished that the teacher would have sent the pupils to that place. John Yusuf Joseph Opokugako has been speaking to Reverend John in team for your MP for Sinsa. I would have thought that it is, but I'm, I'm, I've been assured that it is, uh, it is sufficient for, for the, for the big school. Of course, the primary school would also have to have their facility. But I would have thought that whilst we are making steps to um, to be able to establish an independent ICT lab for the primary school, they could have, in all, uh, in all intent and purposes, they could have easily assessed the, fa the, the current facility being used by the GHS, which is just sharing a compound, um, instead of having to improvise with stone. And I, I, I find that I find that we could have avoided that tangent, and rather sought to use the nearby facility whilst we wait for efforts to be. Well, we are working also... So you think the teacher did the wrong thing by improvising to the extent of making use of a stone? That will be for GES to determine if it is outside the ethics of GES to improvise in a manner that was done. That will have to be the determination by the GES. I would not falter the teachers that did this but my apologies to the innocent children who have to be exposed and, and, and disgraced in a manner as it was done and sent viral. Uh, we may not appreciate the, the extent to which they may probably be feeling embarrassed as we speak and, and my sympathies to them. But my concern here is that, yes, as in South, we have genuine challenges specifically with regards to our ICT facility, um, centers for, for basic schools, those that do not have yet and we are making steps, we are taking steps towards uh, ensuring that the basic schools have ICT facilities. So just maybe the teacher could have done the better thing by taking them to the nearby centre, but isn't it amazing that in this 21st century basic school from primary one to primary six, not even a single computer for them to be able to make use of one way or the other and may, may probably have to fall on a nearby school, which is the alternative that you are suggesting, you know, that you are suggesting. Isn't it amazing that 21st century, not even a single computer for the entire basic school itself? These are peculiar challenges that we sit with in our part of the world, which we would have to certainly move away from as we are rapidly you know, developing, we would have to, and we, we are competing equally with every other student on any part of the world. We do not have any excuse. Well, our joining us is learning that the ICT laboratory belonging to the JSS session is about 400 meters away from where the primary section is. 
The minority in Parliament has kicked against a bill introduced by government on Tuesday to allow for the scrapping of minority import duty on spare parts. According to the minority leader, Haruna Idrisu, the memorandum accompanying the Customs Excise Amendment Bill 2017 is incomplete and is thus unconstitutional. Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Kwating Tuesday afternoon moved the motion for the adoption of the bill. But the minority leader says not only does the bill breach the 1992 constitution, but it also breaches their course treaty and should be withdrawn. Joseph Pukugako wraps up events in Parliament Tuesday. Today has been one of those very busy days in the Parliament of Ghana. Earlier in the day, there was the Get Fund formula that was brought to the House, which the House subsequently approved. This was after a very heated debate on that. Essentially, the House approved the formula that would allow for the disbursement of an amount in the region of um, 790 million Ghana cities to get fund for specific projects that are due to be rolled out across the country when it comes to education infrastructure. There was a bit of a controversy with that. The minority in parliament indicated that they've seen a situation of cuts when it comes to the allocation to get fund because back in 2016 the allocation to get fund was more than a billion cities and compared to the 750 million cities that has been allocated currently, they raised concern that it's very much likely that this could result in educational infrastructure across the country stalling and they felt that was bad enough and they attributed this to an effort by the finance minister to do what has been described as the capping resulting in a situation where there won't be enough um, money for education. James Klucha Veggie, the deputy minority leader, led the charge when it comes to that but there were responses from the minority side indicating that all will be done to still ensure adequate provision of support when it comes to the educational sector. Beyond that as well, the House has also been discussing um, a bill that's come to Parliament, the Customs Excise Amendment Bill 2017, and that bill is supposed to allow for the amendment of the law so that then the promise that was given in the 2017 budget that we would see the duty on spare parts being removed. When that bill is eventually passed, that would allow for that. It was debated on the floor of Parliament earlier today. The minority had very huge concerns about that. In fact, they were raising issues about the constitutionality of the bill that has been brought because the minority leader here in Idris indicated that there is an, uh, some additional details when it comes to the memoranda that should have been submitted that weren't submitted. There, there were other concerns that the minority again raised about the fact that this won't result in any drastic reduction in the prices of spare parts because there would end up being only a 3% reduction in the price because it's only the import duty that been scrapped, the VAT would remain on the import and the NHIL does the health insurance levy would remain. So that won't make much of a difference. Eventually, when it comes to approval for this, it was deferred to tomorrow and the conversation and the third reading of that particular bill would actually happen tomorrow and the expected approval would happen. One other thing that happened within the precincts of the House but outside Parliament proper was what was a press conference by First Deputy Speaker of Parliament Joseph Osewusu who has been addressing the media on the plans to vet Chief Justice nominee Sophia Kufu. We all know that there was a publication that she will be vetted on Monday the 19th of June but the Honorable Joe Osewusu has indicated that she would rather be vetted on Friday, this coming Friday, and they've pushed that forward because they are concerned about a vacuum that's been created with the Chief Justice, George Nawood, retiring, and also the indication being that the acting Chief Justice would also be going on retirement sometime soon. So they need to get Madam Sophia Kufu in place. He's been assuring that once they get the vetting done on Friday, they hope to finish a report on her at the level of the appointment committee by over the weekend, and uh, approval by the House should be given by next week, Tuesday. He's right, and that's it for the bulletin. My name is Israel. I thank you very much for watching. You have a good night. This is Joy News Prime.